The way that I discovered my abilities was through a near-death experience at the age of 14. Very soon after that experience, I actually began to notice that everything that is had a small, thin, golden aura around it. And I knew that something was different. I didn't know quite what. But a few weeks later, in my grandmother's house, I found a deck of tarot cards and they just literally came to life for me. And then I knew that I had something. After developing my gifts with tarot, probably two years into working and reading for the public, I began to realize that I was actually hearing, feeling, and seeing. So it wasn't just messages coming off the cards. In the very beginning, I would actually run my hands over cards and I could perceive energy through my hands. And then I noticed that it's actually coming in through the back of my head, above my head, uh, beside me, sometimes right through the center of me. And that's where I really began to realize that I was actually developing as a clairvoyant. I didn't ever believe that it was hallucination, but it was in the beginning, it was shocking to me that what I was getting was actually accurate and people were really responding. When I started reading for the public shortly thereafter, I had a, a client, my very first client actually, who is still my client today, came to me with a very serious situation and I told her, I said, Jean, I see a yellow envelope arriving in the mail on Wednesday and it's going to be good news. And a yellow envelope arrived on Wednesday and it was good news. So when I, those sorts of things started to happen, it's just more and more proof to me that this is real, you really do do this, and this has validity, and it's a wonderful service for you to provide. So I continued to work my full-time regular job as a travel agent for several years, and I began just doing readings full-time from my home in Ohio, and then moved to California, and that's what I do today. I've had several very powerful experiences in validating communication with the other side. The most recent was actually quite dramatic. I had a young girl call me for an appointment and this girl arrived at my office absolutely emotionally raw. She had just lost her boyfriend three days prior. He was murdered and this girl was just full of emotion. And immediately the boyfriend came through. He mentioned five things right off the top that she kept screaming and saying, that's him, that's him, that's him. And answered questions and gave information about his death, information about his murder, and as many people in spirit do, reassuring her that the death process was not a process of pain that it was quick and immediate, and like flipping a switch. But at the end of the session, the young lady asked me, is there anything that he can say to me that is so specific that I know for sure that it's really him? And as I began to explain to her, you know, it's not like you see on TV and he's given you several examples that you have acknowledged it's him. As soon as I began to say that, I saw the vision of him making signs with his hands that it ended up he was involved in some type of gain activity and the sign that he made with his hands when I mimicked it she screamed again and she said that's his sign that's him there's no way I could have known that and that experience was so powerful that in a 45 minute period I saw this young lady go from raw to walking out the door light and with a smile on her face and to date, I've probably received four or five phone calls from her thanking me for letting me know that it was real. Another instance that I often share is a woman who came to me at a psychic fair. When she came in, again, looked as if she had just really been through a very bad time. And she sat down. I had her mother and father come in on the right and her husband and daughter come in on the left. And... I told her, I have these people with me, and in they're in spirit. And she says, my husband just died two weeks ago. And as soon as she said that, he said to me, make sure you tell her 
that I heard her the last four days of my life. So I told her, he says he wants you to know that he heard you the last four days of his life. And she burst into tears and said, my husband was in a coma the last four days of his life and boy, did I do a lot of talking. I forgave, I asked for forgiveness, and I told my husband that I loved him. And until this moment, I didn't know that he hurt me. And I literally watched pounds come off of this lady, pounds of weight, emotion come off of her to know that he had heard her say that she loved him. People never come through angry. People never come through with negative emotions. They're always very happy to connect with their loved one on this side. They all tell me that the moment of death is a moment of illumination and that they go back to a place where they have all of the answers to everything. There's no fear, there's no worry, there's no upset. They leave this plane and the only thing that they take with them is the love that they created here on Earth. All of the problems, the difficulties, the strifes, the animosities, those all stay here for us to deal with. They no longer have any attachments or any connections to it. So I'll give you an example on that. I had a client come to me. Uh, it was actually a lady that I worked with. Her and her husband had had a horrible fight. And the night after that fight, he slept on the sofa. And she got up the next morning, and he had died. And in the heat of the argument, he had taken his wedding ring off, and she couldn't find it. When she came to me, she was absolutely distraught because she was so stuck in the place of the argument and the fight and the distress and the guilt and shame for all of the things that had been said. But he's coming through saying, hey, it's no problem. You know, it is what it is, and I know that you didn't mean it, and I'm here on this side, and I know your heart. I know what your feelings are. I have to tell you, I worked very, very hard with this client, but I could not get her to see or understand that it's okay for her to release that guilt, that shame, and that he did forgive her and that there is no animosity. Sometimes it's difficult for them, for people to actually grasp being in a vibration of no negativity whatsoever, being completely open and absolutely free of all negativity. They don't want us to be sad. As a matter of fact, when my mother-in-law passed away, I came back from out of town and went to her novenas and I sat down and it was I'd been working on the road and it's the first moment that I had to actually focus on what had happened and I became emotional and you know I started to tear up and I started to cry and my mother-in-law is Mexican and she stepped right in behind me and clearly said no me lloras Terry no me lloras don't cry for me they don't want us to cry. Sometimes people get very angry and upset because they can't get contact with their loved one who has passed away. The truth is, is if we don't process our grief on this side, they can't get to us from that side directly. Because if they did, it would be like ripping the scab off of a wound. And then you have to start the process all over again. So... It's important for us to work our grief on this side so that we can be clear, open, and able to receive from people on that side. They always, always concur that they're with them, that they're watching them, they're watching over them. Oftentimes they give direct advice. Recently I had someone uh, who had lost a husband unexpectedly who was talking about being with the children. I have grandmothers constantly telling me that they're, they're visiting the children at night in their sleep. Children are especially psychic. They are especially empathic and clairvoyant. They often, before they start school, will have much more powerful abilities, abilities psychically and empathically. 
And as we get into the educational process, it starts to be trained out of us, uh, most of us. And however, over the last 10 to 15 years, I have really begun to see a huge increase in the number of children that are coming in much more sensitive, much more aware spiritually and psychically. There's numerous ways that spirit can actually connect with us, even people who don't consider themselves to be clairvoyant or sensitive in any, in any way. One of the most common things that people need to look for is fragrances. Fragrance is the quickest pathway to the brain. It's also the easiest energy to manipulate. If you're sitting in your home and all of a sudden there's a fragrance that reminds you of someone who has passed, that's that person right in front of you. My mother, three weeks after her passing, my dog came running down the hall and the next thing I knew, my entire living room was the fragrance of my mother's skin cream when I was a child. And it lingered for hours. And it was so evident that my mother was right there with me. It was literally like I was having a direct visitation. So fragrance is one of the most common and one of the easiest. Coolness. A sense of coolness, like a, br a brush with a cool breeze coming through the room with no explanation. That is also a very, very strong sign that spirit is present. Change in temperature. The sense that you're, it's almost like that sense of being watched. Uh, a knowing, a feeling like someone else is in the room with you is also a very strong sign that spirit is present. My rule of thumb is, and, and what I hear from my guides is, your first thought is always in alignment with spirit. Your second thought is always you arguing with the first thought. So the thought is, wow, I'm thinking about mom. Oh, that's just my imagination. What other method are they going to utilize to communicate with you if they don't use your imagination? If they appeared to you, they would scare you half to death. They come through your imagination. They come through your senses. Dreams are probably one of the most common method of communication with people. And, you know, there's a period, there can be a period shortly after death where spirit is very active. And then there's a back-off period. It doesn't mean that the loved one has moved on, has left, is nowhere to be found. They're still present, but they don't need to be so present with you all the time. So there's multiple ways that they actually come through. We just have to be open, aware, trusting, and allow the possibility that, yes, mom's actually reaching out to me. Uncle Fred is actually reaching out to me. You can speak to them directly through your mentality, through your thoughts. Um, you can speak out loud to them. It doesn't really matter. Whatever is most comfortable for you is what's comfortable for them. When my mother passed away, my mother and father had been married for 61 years. And I was very concerned about my dad and his ability to even make it through. And as I left after my mother's funeral, I told my father, Dad, talk to mom and tell her everything that you feel and listen and she'll answer you. And for a month on the phone, every time I would talk to him, he would, he would say, I, I talk to mom all the time and she, I'm not hearing anything from her. She's not answering me. And it occurred to me, I said, Dad, you need to listen with your heart, not your ears. When I say that we hear them, yes, we hear them, but we're not hearing them with our ears. We're hearing them with our heart, we're hearing them with our mind, or we're hearing them in our gut. That's most common. Again, if there was a voice that came booming out of the, out of the air, it would probably frighten the person, although, I have had experiences and 
clients have mentioned to me experiences where they literally have heard audible voices. Some mediums hear audible voices. Even I do occasionally. But most common, it's going to come through heart, head, or gut. Having told my father that, now my father has a sense of communication with my mother. When people connect with a loved one in a session with me, I have never seen it be a bad connection at all. Um, there's always a very positive result. There's always an uplifting energy um, in their emotions, in their spirit. They walk away feeling happy. They walk away feeling the love. It's, it's interesting, it's like taking two electrical wires and bringing them together, but it's not electricity, it's, it's love flowing. Um, that's the most beautiful thing, and that's the most beautiful thing, and my favorite thing about my work is actually connecting people from the other side because it's so healing. It's so incredibly healing. The number one question that I have from clients is, are they okay? Absolutely. They have absolutely no choice but to be okay. They're in a place that is so much better that we can't even imagine. Sometimes in cases of trauma or traumatic death, I have had a few instances where I have connected with someone who has had a very traumatic death experience and has had difficult crossing over to the other side. I once experienced driving on the road and there had been an accident on the freeway and someone had died in that accident just seconds before we arrived. And my being a medium, this man is immediately in my face saying, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. I, I'm out of my body, I can't get in my body. And, you know, talk very calmly, very clearly, and try to help direct this person into the light. That's the first time that I ever experienced someone in the death process in a state of upset or confusion. I'll be doing a reading with a client who has someone with Alzheimer's or dementia who's still alive, and I'm connecting with them in spirit. And they're telling me, oh, I'm here sometimes, I'm here sometimes, but sometimes I'm there, and then I come back here, and then I go there. So they go back and forth, and especially with these particular illnesses, I'm often told after the death process, you know, what you saw in my passing, I wasn't there. So if, and, and even with cancer, if it's an ugly passing, they tell me, hey, I wasn't in the body to experience any of that. So, you know, I'm already over here. This is just the process of this physical machine shutting down. When people go into hospice here in the United States, hospice has a book that they give out that actually tells the signs of what you can expect when someone is passing and talking about relatives who've passed before, looking at people in the side of the room, raising their hands up to someone in a, in a welcoming gesture. Uh, those are all signs. And they very clearly, even my father in the course of a heart attack once, said that he saw his mother standing in the corner and she had been gone for many years. As a medium, I'm able to shut down uh, whenever I want. I have an agreement with my guides that I am always 24 hours a day in a constant state of protection. And I trust that and I believe that. And I have had that proven to me over and over and over that it works. As far as walking down the street or going to the grocery store and seeing dead people walk through the aisles, it really is not like that. But in all honesty, in lots of occasions, I'll turn my head and see a flash of someone here or someone there. But it's, no, it's not constant. It's difficult to see the pain that people are in and actually create because of their own fear and their disbelief. It 
used to be super difficult for me to handle when people didn't get it or I couldn't get through to them. And finally, you just have to, I just had to come to a place where I give the information and I'm not, I can't be responsible for what's, how someone interprets it or what they do with it. That was actually a, a very powerful victory for me personally. Probably one of the strongest misconceptions that people have about mediums is that we have some sense of control over who or what it is that comes through. I am at the discretion of the spirits as to what they want to say. In other words, I can't necessarily tell someone exactly what they want to hear. I have to say word for word what I get from the other side. It may not be congruent. And, you know, your father, your mother, your Uncle John or Aunt Mary, when they come through from spirit on the other side, they are usually not the same as they were when they were here. So oftentimes people will say, oh my God, that's exactly how my dad would say it. Or, oh my God, that's exactly how my mother would say it. But in attitude and such, they may not be as they were in life. I'll give you an example. In marriages, perhaps the husband was extremely jealous. And on the other side, he's coming through saying, my dear, you're young, I'm, I'm dead. I want you to go forth and be loved as I would have loved you. Which in life, he would have been, no, I want you to stay home and I, I don't want you to see anyone else and I don't want you to have friends. But on the other side, he's, I want you to be loved as I would have you loved. Absolutely, totally disattached from ego. We all have guides. We all have angels. Guides can be people who have lived on the earth before and who have lived life and had experiences and have become ultimately highly aware and able to bring help and assistance. Angels are those who have never walked the earth plane, and they're very special and very powerful. For me, ancestral people and guides come in in this area for me, and angels come in directly from in front of me or from above my head or right up through the center of my being. You can ask anything that you like. One of the biggest issues for people in their communication with spirit, their guides and their ancestors, is that they just simply don't ask. We have been trained and believe so strongly that it's not normal, it doesn't happen, it's not real, that we actually forget to ask for what we want. But I say ask for what you want and then start looking hearing, feeling, knowing, sensing what's going on around you. An example on that, I had a friend, Danny, pass away several years ago, and I was on my way to be with his physical body before they removed it, and as I was getting ready to turn into the hospital parking lot, a car cut me off, violently cut me off moving into the parking lot, and it made me pay attention and when I looked at the license plate on the car, it said, I am free. And then I hear in my head, tell my mama. I walked in the room. There stood his mother. His mother had just lost her son. I said, ma'am, I need you to know. Danny sent me a message. The message is, I'm free. It makes absolute sense. And it's absolute truth. Danny had been plagued with really horrible medical situations, and he's free. He's letting everyone in the room know, hey, I'm free. Everything works. Oftentimes, elderly people will, will come to me, and they're giving me the symbolism of them doing exercise or jumping jacks. And that says to me, everything works. I have no limitations. And that's good news for people here. 
Everyone has free will. God will not even interfere with someone's free will. Free will is very powerful. If someone is not open to the possibility of communication with the other side, they're not going to receive anything. If someone is open to the possibility of communication with the other side, they're open to receive any and as much as they are willing to receive. On free will, I would also like to say that free will, it makes it very, very difficult to predict events, to predict people's behavior, because I can predict what can happen for someone. But if they don't take the steps to allow it to happen, or they have resistance, it's not going to happen. As an example, I had two sisters come to me who wanted to make a huge move. And I gave them all of the steps that they would need to make to make the move. And a year and a half later, there was no move. And when they came for me for the second appointment, they said, Oh, we really want to know the day and time that we'll be moved. I can't predict that. And I can't predict that because I can't predict your behavior. If you do this, 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 and this, you'll be moved. But if you do nothing, you're not going to be moved. We all come here to do work. We all come here for a purpose. We all come here for a mission. But we are given the free will to do what we've come here to do or to not do it. It's completely up to us. God, Spirit, the angels, the guides, they're not going to force us to do what it is that we're supposed to do. They can aid us in helping to try to guide us to do what we're supposed to do. But no one's going to stand there with insistence and force. It's like they don't make things happen to us. We make things happen to us. The choices that I make are the choices that affect my life. Through the truth of our heart, and being true and honest to our heart is what gives us the guidance to follow and find our true mission. Fear is the biggest block on the planet. Fear stops energy in its tracks. And fear is false evidence appearing real. It really is not real. Whenever you have the thought that I would like to do this, I would like to have this job, I would like to have, I would like to make this amount of money, that's where we need to put our focus. This is the type of relationship that I would like to be in. That's where we need to put our focus. And when fear starts coming in and saying, well, that could never happen, you know that that's not going to be, that's when you really need to start addressing the fear and saying, that's not an acceptable outcome. What I'm creating is this. And if you really get good at discussing or shutting down the fear and opening yourself more toward the possibilities of what you do want, the next thing you know, what you want is going to be right in front of you and you're going to be living it. The Law of Attraction is absolutely a reality. There are several different people who've written many books about various forms of the Law of Attraction. It is, It does work. It is something that we have to employ, but it's something we have to work every day. And as a very dear friend and spiritual teacher of mine would say to me, every moment, every thought, every breath is a moment of creation. And if in this moment we are creating love and joy and prosperity, and in the next minute we move into fear, we instantly stop creating the love and the greatness and we start creating the fear. So we start to undo what it is that we're creating. So it's important to stay heavily on the side of creating the positive and focusing on what is desired to be created as opposed to what the fear might be. The biggest problem on the planet today is fear. The reason that fear is a problem, of course, is that it affects everything. Everything we think and say and do, all the decisions and choices we make. 
all of our reactions, all of our responses, everything that we're experiencing can come from only one of two places. Conversations with God has made that very clear to me. We're either coming from love or we're coming from fear. And my observation is that most people, most of the time, and myself, more than I would like to acknowledge, coming from fear. So we have to look at our fears and find out what is fear anyway? What is it all about? What are we afraid of? First of all, as I observe it, we're afraid of life itself. We're afraid of life because we're afraid of death. Conversations with God says that all fear, ultimately, is a fear of death. If you're not afraid to die, then you're not afraid to live. You want to know what fear is defined? The definition of fear is the thought that we are not going to be able to have something we think we need. It's as simple as that. A person who doesn't need anything has no fear of anything. When I don't need anything from you, I don't, I don't fear you. That creates true fearlessness. And most spiritual masters reside in that place, a place of utter fearlessness. So when I begin to look at my own fears and begin to feel them, and when I have a, an idea that my fears are starting to, how do I say this, overcome me, overpower me almost, paralyze me, because all of us have been paralyzed by fear at one time or another, I take a close look at what do I think I need? More often than not, almost all the fears that I see people experiencing have to do with relationships of one kind or another, and especially those delicate relationships that we call romantic. First, I'm afraid that no one's going to love me, and then I'm afraid if somebody does, I'm going to lose the love. And how I solve that, when I do, except when I don't, but how I solve that when I do, how I get into a place of what I want to call spiritual health, is when I understand who I truly am and that I actually don't need the love of another or any other in order to experience who I truly am, in order to experience um, serenity, peace, joy, happiness. Every time I think that my joy is obtainable, or that I'm sourced with my joy, that my joy comes from someplace outside of myself, I get into fear. Every time I'm clear that the source of my joy does not exist outside of myself, but is given to me, from me, by me, my fear disappears. And here's the irony of that. I then become much more attractive to people, and what I was afraid of, that people would walk away from me, in fact, doesn't happen. The reverse happens. People are attracted to me because all people are attracted to other people who are firm and strong, not arrogant, but aware, and reside deep inside of themselves. If I feel that you need me so much, then my next fear will be I can't give you what you need, and that's why I'll lose you, you see. So people who present themselves to the world as serene and peaceful and joyful and in innately happy these are people who are aware that their happiness, their joy, and their peace comes from within. And that's, I think, the spiritual journey. That's the path to transformation. That's the movement away from fear. And if you live your life filled with inspiration and excitement, soon there's nothing to be afraid of. And it becomes the great joy it was always intended to be. Indigo children, crystal children, very, very empowered souls. Coming here to the planet to really enlighten and to hold very powerful space for the planet, to, I believe, to return us to a place of love and make a huge, tremendous di difference in this time of spiritual revolution, time of spiritual change. Kind of as the aspect of being guiding light, in the process of leading us in a much more positive direction. If you look at any of uh, bringing in the, the talents of astrology, if you look at any of the outer planet qualities in the last 20 years, they have all been, you and your generation are here to break down the systems of society so that they can be reconstructed in a form that's good for the whole so that it's not individual, it's not selfish, it's not this half and this half, it's encompassing the good of the whole. That's why crystal children and indigo children have come here, and that's why this revolution is taking place, so that we can move back to a place of love, goodness, and wholeness.